And so just a very brief uh, anatomy reminder of, you know, the size of the lungs of horses. Uh, you can see horses have giant lungs, uh, even in proportion to their large body. Uh, they have more ribs than uh, dogs and, and humans. And so they have that long barrel chest. And these chests is, you know, like three quarter full of lungs, basically. So when you have your saddle on the horse, you're sitting on the lungs of your horse. Um, and so because of the neck and nose and head, everything, you know, the intake of the air is quite far away from the, the lungs. So you have that long gray tube on that graph here, which is the, the windpipe or the trachea, and that's bringing down the air from the nostrils into the lungs. And so if we look at those tubes inside the lungs, we call them the bron bronchial tree. Um, so it looks really like this. So it's really like a tree. Uh, but of course it's hollow and it's really pipes uh, bringing the air down into the lungs and bringing it outside uh, with the CO2 after breathing. I'll show you a brief like here video. Uh, so here we are doing with a camera and endoscopy we're in the throat. So that's the voice box of the horse in the throat. And that black hole there is the opening of the glottis and we're gonna go into the uh, windpipe, into the trachea. So we freeze uh, with a solution. You can maybe see the, the, the kind of a solution fluid we send to a freeze and a, it's a local anesthetic. And then we're going through the voice box. It's all open basically. And we're gonna go down in the windpipe. So this is what it looks like. Uh, so it's a long tube. Um, and it has those cartilage rings. You can barely maybe see them on the outside. So it's not like a solid tube, of course, it's flexible. Um, and as you go down, you will end up, uh, you can barely see now at the end, there is a, um, almost a pool or a lake, a small lake of fluid. So that's the part that is horizontal uh, between the shoulders basically of the horse. So when we reach that point, will be really um, at the shoulder level of the horse. So we keep moving in slowly here, because uh, again, we don't want the horse to cough. And you can see that puddle of water, that small lake. So here it's, it means it's horizontal, right? The water is down. So we are on the horizontal part of the trachea. So we're here, yeah, exactly between the shoulders. And we keep going in, keep going in. And now you can see those two uh, big holes holes at the end of the tunnel. So there is a, one on the left and one on the right. I think we're going to see it a little bit better here. And um, those holes are the openings of uh, the right lung and the left lung. So we'll have a better view in a second here. Here you go. Um, so you can see there is that set thumb in the middle and you have a series of pipes on the left, series of pipes on the right. And so you basically pick the lung and move forward. You see that branching, uh, that, that tree basically. So those branches, you know, getting uh, dividing again and again and again. So each time we go to a new generation of bronchus or pipes and they get smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and at some point we're gonna have to basically stop because we're gonna be wedged. Uh, so the camera will be the same diameter as the smallest, uh, the, uh, as one of those bronchi. And of course, those bronchi keep going down and down and down to something that is really microscopic, like, uh, you know, hair thin. Uh, but of course, the camera is much bigger than that and cannot go down there. So this was to show you, you know, like the inside view of your horse's lungs. And so these were, you know, like, okay, that's all I had for anatomy, basically. And so what can go wrong when you have, you know, when you have asthma? So when you have asthma in those lungs, uh, there is really what we call a triad or three, three things. Uh, one is inflammation. So again, be uh, very clear. It's not an infection. We're not talking bacteria, viruses, it's not covid uh, we're talking inflammation, so really more allergies type of things. And then we also have bronchoconstriction. So what does that mean? That means that all those pipes we, you know, travel with that camera are actually shutting down and narrowing down and sometimes closing. So the third thing is mucus production. So there is a lot more material, a lot more viscous stuff, mucus, you know, uh, stuck really in those pipes. 
And so those three things are really the, the hallmark of uh, uh, asthma. And so uh, with the mucus and inflammation, there is some irritation. It's kind of an irritant for those uh, airways. And that's why your horses are going to cough. So why do they cough? They cough because it's ir irritating them. And they are trying to get rid of the mucus. They are trying to get rid of those uh, particulates, whatever is in their lungs. And so how do they do that? They push hard on the chest, close the valve, the voice box, put the air under pressure, and then suddenly they open and that's the, <coughs> the cough you hear. Okay, so the cough is really a protection basically to get rid of the mucus, get rid of you know, whatever dust is in those lungs. And so when we talk about equine asthma, I mean, it's relatively recent. Like, you know, we, before we were saying um, heaves, uh, COPD, inflammatory airway disease, all sorts of names, even veterinarians were confused. You know, only the researchers and specialists could keep up with the changes in nomenclature. But now, you know, it's been uh, uh, four years or so that we're calling it equine asthma because it's much simpler, much you know, easier for everyone to understand what we're talking about. The thing is equine asthma is one big word for two different things uh, because it's not exactly the same for all those horses. So you have on the right, the severe asthma and on the left, what we call the mild moderate asthma. Okay, and those are quite different. And I'll show you here. Um, the clinical signs. So clinical signs are really the difference between the severe asthma and the mild moderate asthma. So what does a horse with severe asthma looks like? Here. Um, I'm not sure you have sound, but it's not really necessary anyway, but you can see that poor mare is really pushing hard and she is not coming back from a run. She's not coming back from exercise. She is like this day and night 24 seven all the time. And so you can see that she's basically pushing hard with her abdomen. So that's a, at rest. So that's really the key. At rest, this horse is having labored breathing or an asthma crisis, if you want. If you look at her nostrils, we, we see nostril flare, right? See, she's really trying to scoop in as much air as she can. Um, and again, she's not coming from a run. She's like this all the time. Okay, um, another horse here where you can see the abdominal push and it's really a push. You can see the, the muscles from the belly are really pushing and you see the push is very long. So they inspire quickly and they push, 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 inspire quickly, push, 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 push. So really the problem for these horses is not to get air in the lungs, it's to get air out of the lungs. So they are trying how to push the air outside the lungs and that's their problem. Then I said, you know, severe asthma on the right, my moderate asthma on the left. So this is the different one. This is my moderate asthma. And I'm not sure if we're gonna have sound, but even if we don't, you'll see, oh, uh, sorry. You will see that horse coughing. And so, like now, you see, like she's running, she's just, you know, jogging slowly and look at that, coughing again, <clears throat> coughing again, and <clears throat> coughing again. So she's really just coughing and having decreased performance. She, if she stops, she's in her stall, she's a happy camper, she's breathing normally. This one, same thing, huff, re ridden horse, coughing, and huff, coughing again. So again, those, those are, signs, you know, and, and many people in the past will say, oh yeah, my horse is coughing three, four times when I start riding and that's normal. No, it's not. Well, you know, if I, um, if I, uh, if I start running, I'm not going to cough. So again, um, this is abnormal and this is, I'm not saying, you know, every horse coughing has asthma. Be careful. It's absolutely wrong. Not the case. You could have infections with, uh, you could have COVID, you could have anything else, right? But I mean, in horses, Cough is just, you know, a sign that something's going on with those lungs. So um, we have like 16 or so people. Um, I wanted to do a quick poll and I'm not sure if that's going to work because the poll function doesn't work here, but you can um, probably uh, show us like with a, a thumbs up or down. Uh, how many of you um, have 
or or had recently a horse that showed some coughing uh, during exercise. So yes, one. So and you can do it also with the thumb up or down in your uh, in your um, I think emoji box or uh, whatever is it? Uh, yeah. And Luisa, I'll let you have a look because I can't see it from here on my uh, on my on my uh, laptop. Sorry, Renaud, just say that one more time. So uh, if you can have a look at how many people say yes or no, they have a horse with uh, coughing during exercise, like or, or or had recently a horse cough during exercise. I would. I need everyone to use the chat function because it actually kicked me out, and so now I can't see everybody. I can just see Renault. Oh, okay. We're having some technical difficulties. I don't know why. Oh, Tara said yes. She's had a horse cough. We got one yes. If everyone could just chime in on the chat button there on the bottom. Janet says yes. So it's usually very common, and and again. People were really ignoring it before, but now we know actually it's not something to be ignored. It's really something important. So we are at uh, probably a third of yeses so far, and uh, I, I would probably expect even more than that. But that, that's okay. That's fine. Um, good. Thank you. So let's so cough again um, means you know something's going on in those lungs so again could be an infection could be something else but it's interesting to to see that you know uh, people should be aware that coughing is abnormal and so back in the you know 2008 or 9 something like that we used a questionnaire that was a validated questionnaire asking a bunch of questions about coughing nasal discharge abdominal uh, effort, uh, nostril flare, and all those things in, in horses. And we use those questionnaires because uh, it was shown that actually owners are much better than veterinarians at observing the changes in the respiratory signs of their horses. So there was that study where they looked at performance, uh, cough, nasal discharge, um, and they looked at owners versus veterinarians and owners are much more um, sensitive. So they are, they are, they will pick an improvement earlier than the veterinarian, uh, which makes sense because the owners, you know, spend a lot more time with their horses. So, um, so basically what I'm trying to say is owners, you know, feedback is very important in those questionnaires and their observations are usually right and, and reliable. And so, Based on, you know, the observations from horse owners in Alberta, again, uh, on, yeah, 10 years ago plus now, um, we found that, you know, one question that is key to ask uh, is, did your horse cough uh, in the past or recently? So if the answer is yes, we had 97% sensitivity, which means that it's a very good screening question. So if a horse is coughing, 97% chances were that there was something wrong with those lungs. And in this case, in our case was asthma because it was an asthma study, but basically cough is a key respiratory sign for equine asthma. The other respiratory signs, uh, nasal discharge and performance or exercise intolerance. Um, and then there are subtle differences, you know, it's coughing frequently or coughing during exercise or coughing, coughing at the beginning of exercise. But basically, the timing of the cough is not always the same and could mean something different eventually. Um, so coughing, we said, was very important. Another thing that's important, as I mentioned already, is mucus. And mucus is often increased in asthma. Um, so how do you know if your horse has some mucus, for example, in the lungs, in the windpipe, where we've exercised, that mucus is going to come out. So the mucus seen from the outside is really the nasal discharge. And we're not talking, you know, creamy, yellow pus type of thing. Like it could be, but most of the time, um, this is the kind of mucus we're dealing with. Um, so it's really... Um, uh, Sorry, I'm trying to uh, here get my oh, pointer um, just to show you here. Yes. So 
if you can see that, right? So that's bilateral, both nostrils. After a light exercise, just lunging that horse. And this is the type of mucus we get. So again, not like the creamy, you know, yellow stuff. Um, and so these are the clinical signs you can see on your horse and they should be a red flag or they should be telling you, huh, something may be brewing into those lungs and it could be asthma, it could be something else, but, you know, most frequently asthma. And actually, um, I'm going to, you know, plug like a, a research project we're going to do this summer. And so we would need nine horses this summer with some cough and or some mucus like I showed on that slide. And so if you have, if you're interested, you have horses, you want to participate, you can send me an email and I'll talk more at the end about this anyway. So you have those clinical signs and uh, we think, yes, okay, my horse may have asthma, but am I the only one? Like how common is asthma? Well, we did again uh, a study again 10 years ago in Alberta where we went all uh, you know, across uh, some barns in the Calgary area. We uh, looked at uh, 167 horses <clears throat> where we did endoscopies, we did uh, diagnostic tests like a bronchial lavage, I'm gonna talk about it. And basically we found that shockingly, two thirds of the horses had some lung inflammation. And so it was moderate, but it was there. So really, of course, there was a little bit of a bias in the study because it wasn't like randomly picking horses. It was mostly horses from owners who were interested in participating in the study, which means they probably picked up that the horses were not 100% normal. But it gives you an idea of the still the frequency. It's a very frequent problem. And it's not just, you know, those young race horses running at the track. Uh, it's all horses, all disciplines, Western, English, anything, uh, draft horses, everything, and all ages. It's not just an old horses issue or young horses issue. It really affects any age, any discipline. And so back again to the equine asthma, severe on the right, my moderate on the left, uh, which had different names in the past. And really the, the difference between the two is really, again, that labored breathing at rest or the asthma crisis, like you can imagine someone having an asthma attack uh, is really the severe asthma case. Um, uh, so at rest versus the my moderate asthma, those are, you know, athletes or performance horses or, or even backyard horses. But I mean, they are rideable, they are performing, they're just not at the best and they're having those cough, mucus, clinical signs. So, we know what asthma looks like. So what does trigger asthma? Well, the trigger is really the dust. That's the key word. Like if you have one thing to remember is asthma equals dust. It's, uh, and what's in the dust? Well, the dust is a very complex mixture. Uh, we call them that complicated name here, aeroallergens, uh, organic dust. So there is a bunch of things in there. There are like pieces of bacteria, there are pollens, there are, fungal so, uh, uh, and, and other chemicals. So it's, it's actually quite complicated. And where is the dust coming from? Uh, well, it's mainly coming from two things, bedding and hay. So if your horse is outside, of course, bedding is out of the equation, but uh, the hay then is really the main, main source. And then you have other less usual sources like pollen, so trees around, even chicken or birds, for example, um, and, and there are also horses that are even worse on pasture outside without the bedding. It's because they are exposed to other allergens, okay? And so um, sometimes they can be exposed outside to more pollens. They can be exposed to even chemicals, field spraying. And so when we did our analysis, uh, questionnaire analysis 10 years ago, we found that's really interesting because in Alberta, we found that a horse outside was twice more likely uh, to have severe asthma. So I'm not talking my moderate asthma, I'm talking just a severe asthma here. And we're wondering why, why is that? Like, you know, outside should be good for your horses to breathe and like fresh air, everything's good. Well, this is the issue. That's the culprit here, uh, the round hay bales. And um, because those horses, like you can see on that picture are digging in the hay bale and so we found that when horses are outside in Alberta, 
they are six times more likely to be fed those large round hay bales, and they end up twice as more, twice, uh, yeah, um, twice more likely, two, two more chance, uh, yeah. You double the risks basically of having severe asthma uh, when you're on those round hay bales. Um, other things that don't help, if you remember, um, uh, the in the summer when we have those very cloudy, smoggy, foggy, uh, you know, conditions in in the Calgary area from the BC fires, uh, so you have a very high air quality index, very high risk, not only for people with asthma but also for horses. So. We've seen a little bit what asthma looks like. We've seen a little bit what are the triggering factors, but you know, why do we talk about asthma? Like, should we really care? Like, you know, maybe it's not that big of a deal. Well, let's go back to what lungs do, right? So lungs get oxygen from the air into the blood, right? So the, the, the air goes through that wall, microscopic wall into the alveoli, into the lungs. Um, and it's transferred from the air to the red blood cells and vice versa. When the red blood cells come back, they are transferring the CO2 out of the body into the, uh, into the air, into the alveoli. And it's, you know, breathing in, breathing out. And um, in the eighties, uh, Dr. Barry Grant from Washington State University, who you can see here with his dog hat here on a, on a race horse, um, he was interested in exercise physiology and he was really a very interesting, uh, good researcher and a good jockey. So he could ride those horses on the track at full speed. And I'm talking like full gallop. And the horses had a catheter in an artery on the neck and you can see the neck bandage here. And he was able to pull arterial blood at full speed on those horses as the horses were galloping and throwing the arterial blood syringe on the ground on the track. And then people were running, collecting the blood and analyzing the oxygen content. And so that group was the first one to show that actually those very nice, good looking, perfectly healthy thoroughbreds are actually hypoxemic. So their oxygen values are very low in their blood when they run. And this is normal. It's not a disease. It's not abnormal. It's it's physiological. That's the way horses are built. And that's actually amazing because when you see an oxygen content or pressure of only 68 millimeter mercury in these COVID days, you know, if you had that today, you would be rushed to uh, the hospital in emergency care for, you know, COVID oxygen and everything, you know, like in India where they need oxygen. Um, here, horses can just run and keep running with that very low oxygen content. But why is this important? Because that means that even on those very nice, trained, healthy horses with perfectly working lungs, the lungs are the weak link. There are still, they still don't have enough lungs. So horses by design, by nature, the limiting factor of the whole uh, exercise performance and um, uh, exercise physiology is the lung. So this is a very low oxygen content of the blood on a horse with a normal lung. So now can you imagine, and, and they looked at that, what's going to happen if those lungs are not normal, i.e. asthma, for example. So these graphs are just showing, and, you know, just showing that if you look at here, IAD, EIPH, or mix of everything anyway, so as soon as you have any issue in those lungs or in the throat, right away as you increase speed, as those horses are galloping fast, very quickly, your blood content in oxygen goes down. And so this would be the normal horses. And as soon as something happens, the blood content goes down. So asthma horses will have less oxygen in their blood when they run. And another group from Laurent Quetil uh, recently in 2018 showed that for each percent of inflammation that I have in the lung of race horses, so we're talking, you know, race horses on flat racing, there is a decrease in what we call their speed figure. And so for every percent, you have an association with a lack of speed or performance uh, in those race horses. 
And they also found, interestingly, on those 63 racehorses, they tested that 80% of them had some sort of lung inflammation. So back again to the frequency and prevalence, highly, highly prevalent, like a lot of horses have lung inflammation. And unfortunately, they are performance horses often, and so they are not performing at their full capacity. Um, we also did ourselves some uh, a study where we uh, measured the lung functions of horses. So we had a mask on the nose of horses like this. It's a half mask, so there is still the bit and the mouth is, you know, uh, free to work normally. And so this is just, you know, with those two small tubes measuring the airflow and the content in oxygen just from the air going in and out the nostrils. And the rider is riding, we're looking at, you know, heart rate, we're looking at speed, we're looking at everything with an uh, onboard in the backpack uh, computer and analyzers. And basically what we found is that, um, oh, and I can show you a video here. Um, oh, and if it's gonna, I need to remove my, uh, sorry, my uh, laser pointer here. I'll show you what it looks like. So the horse is running full speed and happy to run with that half mask. It's not obstructing anything. The bit is there and life is good. And so what we do there is measure the maximal lung function of those horses. So how much oxygen can those horses move in and, and uh, in those horses? Um, and we found that, uh, you know, when we had those smoggy, foggy days, the lung function or oxygenation capacity of those lungs was actually decreased. Um, and as soon as the air quality improved, we saw an improvement in the VO2 or the lung function, if you want, by 13%. So in those thoroughbreds, we had a 13% improvement only by you know, having those uh, clouds of smog clearing up. And we also had horses on the treatment, like dexamethasone in this case, and there was actually, interestingly, no benefit to add the medical treatment over the improvement of air quality. So the take home message here was that air quality is super important and will improve asthma as much or even better than the medical treatment in those cases. All right, so we know now that um, asthma is probably uh, affecting those horses and makes them cough and having mucus and uh, it's due to those you know, dust issues. So I may have a horse with asthma, how do I know for sure? Well, let's go over the diagnostic here. So we start, you know, as a veterinarian with the history. So how long it's been going on and all these things, which I won't cover here. Then we go over the clinical signs. So again, important, is your horse having issues at rest or also, or only during exercise? And then you'll see sometimes your uh, veterinarian pull a, a bag, a rebreathing bag and do a test like that. And then sometimes we go directly to the endoscopy or bronchial lavage. So we'll, we'll cover those in details here. So this is the rebreathing bag here technique where we are not trying to choke the horse. The goal is actually the opposite. It's to get the horse to breathe air in and out, but air with more CO2. So there is an opening on the top of the bag the air goes in and it's mixed with more CO2 and the horse is breathing. And if you do it well, the horses are actually happy to do it because the, the CO2 has kind of a soothing effect. Um, and then you listen to the lungs. Um, and I wanted to, I, I guess, you know, you probably never listen to lungs. And so here is, oh, I'm not sure we have some actually, do we? No, oh, too bad. Okay, because um, I had some uh, lung sounds for you here, but it looks a little bit, it sounds a little bit like uh, when you are walking on the dry snow, you know, one of these very cold days and just like, <laughs> that's exactly what it sounds like. So the next step after we do that, sometimes, you know, and again, I don't do that. I don't do everything in all the horses. So again, if your veterinarian doesn't do the revisiting bag or doesn't do the endoscopy, that's totally fine. It's, uh, you know, I'm just saying these are the, options and things we can do, but not that we have to do. And so this next thing we can do is an endoscopy, like I showed you at the beginning, but look at this one in comparison to the uh, first video you've seen. So now we are again in that uh, windpipe and look at that white um, mucus at the bottom there. Uh, so pretty bad. And there's even some mucus 
stuck on the ceiling on the roof, right? So you can see all that white creamy stuck, you know, mucus everywhere. Um, so, and it's even now we have a pool of mucus and we're bathing in mucus. So this is a very severe mucus uh, accumulation case and uh, we can actually score it. And so there is a score one, two, three, four. Um, and why do we care about the scoring? Because we know that as soon as there is some mucus, so a score two and more, that will decrease performance in the fast moving horses. So in race horses, a score two of mucus will start decreasing their performance. If you have more of a slower uh, performance horse, let's say for example, short jumper, then a score three or more will definitely decrease performance. And to give you an idea, um, we've done uh, here in Alberta a barrel racer study where we scoped um, 140 horses, over 140 horses. And we found that almost three quarter, almost 75% of the horses had a mucus score of two or more. So again, back to that poor performance thing, it means that, you know, um, probably three quarter of those horses were limited uh, in their performance just by the presence of mucus there. Okay, so it's a big deal. So if you don't have an endoscope or if you don't need to scope the horse as a veterinarian, then the veterinarians will go uh, and do a bronco lavage. So that's another option. And this is actually the best option. That's really the, the diagnostic method. Uh, we call it gold standard. And I hate that word. It's uh, gold standard should be for the US dollar, right? And uh, anyway, so uh, it's more of a reference technique. And so we do a bronco, which means bronchi or tube, alveolar, so deeper, the alveoli, and lavage, which is a wash. So we're gonna wash into the bronchi and the alveoli. So why would we do that? Well, we do that to see, so we in inject fluid and aspirate the fluid back in those deep, deep in those lungs. And we do that um, to have a few uh, answers. So answer number one is, do I have inflammation in this horse? So, is it normal or abnormal? Answer number two is how much inflammation? Uh, do I have like mild, moderate or severe inflammation? Answer number three is what type of inflammation? Do I really have allergies or do I have another type of immune reaction, immune inflammation? And answer number four is even uh, particulate. So can you see dust inside the lungs of my horse? And uh, yes, I mean, if there is a lot of dust in the hay and stuff, it's gonna get in there and I'm gonna see it uh, uh, when I do a, a BAL. So let's have a look at how those works. Um, so the BAL, bronco alveolar lavage. So you, uh, in research, you know, we can do it with a very long endoscope. Uh, and I honestly, you know, rarely do it this way. I only do it this way if I need the video recording and imaging. Uh, but now, you know, I do even in research, uh, my uh, BALs using a long tube like this. Um, and then you inject the cell in, as I said, and you aspirate it and you get that foamy return. And I'll show you more pictures here. So these are my, um, you know, some UCVM uh, veterinary students. Um, and they did a... Um, uh, class project and uh, and some and they were trained to do the BAL. So you pass, uh, you sedate the horse. So the horse is you know sedated. You do a local anesthesia. So you will freeze the throat, freeze the windpipe, so the horse doesn't feel anything and doesn't cough. And you pass the tube in the nose, and then you get you extend the head of the horse like this. You pass the voice box and you go in the windpipe in the trachea, exactly like we did on the first video with the camera, but now you just do it blindly. You don't have a camera on those tubes. And then once you keep going and you wedge your tube at the end, you inject some cell in. So here we use, you know, 250 mLs and uh, then we aspirate the cell in back with those syringes. And we aspirate that fluid and look at that fluid comes back. It's very uh, soapy, foamy, which is great. If you have foam, it means, you know, it's really come back from very deep in the lungs. So that's called uh, the surfactant basically. And um, myself or in research, you know, I'll do two of these lavages, but in practice, you know, if you have one good return like this, it's good enough and you have a good sample. And so then why do we, 
pull that fluid out. Well, we pull that fluid to look at cells. We want to count the cells. We want to see if there is inflammation, how much, and what time. And so it's very complicated, but you know there are different types of cells. We call them mast cells, eosinophils, neutrophils. And those cells will tell me the degree of inflammation and the type of inflammation. And this is what they look like under the microscope. So I do the analysis of uh, those uh, samples from you know, all the veterinarians who want to send them to me um, at the lab at the university. And so these are really those nice uh, strawberry looking type of cells. Those are eosinophils. So they are very, um, you know, they really clearly indicate allergies and so these are when i see those pink strawberries in there it's like allergies those are you know more you see like horseshoe type of uh nuclei in in, in those cells and there is lots and lots and lots of these so this is a lot of neutrophils so this is a lot like there is like mostly neutrophils in that horse here so it's highly very severely inflamed and look at those, like those are also very nice cells. So they're not uh, pink anymore. Those are really dark, dark purple. And every small granule, every small, you know, granule you see there is actually full of histamine, which is like really a nuke bomb uh, to create and, and start inflammation in those lungs. And you see those are like bombers. They are like loaded with those particulates of histamine and just ready to blow them and release them and, and create, you know, a mess in those lungs. Sometimes we see some very cool, you know, like spirals like this. So these are uh, actually mucus plugs and they are like plugging the very, very microscopic uh, tubes or uh, bronchi and, uh, and they have that shape. And look at this when I was saying before that sometimes we see uh, if your horse is exposed to dust. Well, here it is. You see, I'm not sure if it's very clear, but that oblong kind of greenish thing here with almost spikes, this is a pollen particulate. So there's one here, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And you see there is even a band in the middle. And here there is some large vegetal particulate. So this is a cluster of cells that are just trying to chew and get rid of those pollens here. And so this force is exposed, like uh, if this pollen is coming from the air and it's going deep, deep, deep in the lungs and those cells, so that immune system is saying, oh, I don't want these in my lungs. So I'm trying to chew on it. And as they try to chew on it, they trigger some more inflammation. Um, so yeah, quick poll, like very quickly, we're not too, too many people. So how many of you had a BEL done on your horse and uh, how many of you have experienced that so chat right Luisa is the best I think right yeah you can just say yes or no in the chat looks like we one says no oh we got a couple yeses so far oh wow we have a big BAL group for our small, yeah for our small sample yeah. <laughs> double exclamation mark there yeah so I guess that was a good experience. Sometimes it's a, yeah. you know, we never know. We never know. <laughs> okay, yeah. So we have a group of experts here. Okay, good to know. Okay, perfect. So it's not something that's totally new to this group. Okay, perfect. Good. Um, so we've, you know, we identify BELs, we know what it looks like, uh, sorry, we identify asthma, we know what it looks like from the outside of your horse. We know what to do to you know, detect it a little bit better. And now we even know what to do to have a perfect you know, diagnostic test with, with the BEL. So now you come back with your BEL report. Oh, my horse has moderate asthma, allergic type of inflammation, for example. Now what? What do I do? Well, that's where, you know, it's very important to have a very good collaboration and discussion with your veterinarian about, you know, the next step, the treatment and the management. Unfortunately, um, the bad news, and I hate to be the you know, bearer of bad news, but, you know, there is no cure for asthma. So, you know, your expectations may be, okay, well, that's fine. My horse has asthma. I'm going to, you know, get a good drug, uh, medication, and we're done, right? It's going to be over 
Uh, no, absolutely not. That's the issue. Um, you don't get rid of it once you have it. And uh, it's because your horse has that kind of sensitivity uh, to it. You don't really get rid of it. It's like kids or people with asthma. They have a, you know, I don't have asthma. I can be, you know, in a cloud of dust and I'll be totally fine. Um, but, you know, uh, other people next to me may just start, you know, suffocating at the same time. So they have asthma and, you know, they'll, they'll keep having it for decades. So very important as a practical approach to do work on two front lines. One is, you know, asthma is from inflammation, right? We know inflammation is a problem. We know uh, the clinical signs, the mucus, the pipes constricting, everything is due to inflammation. So we need to address the inflammation. We need to control the inflammation. And that's your veterinarian, you know, uh, role is to help you control with medications the inflammation. But the environment, of course, the prevention, the environment is very important. You need to find, okay, where is, the, where is the source of dust? Where is the source of allergen? And I need to prevent exposure to dust. And, uh, you know, I like to say that actually the ball is in your camp, the horse owners, not in the camp of the veterinarian. It's really up to the owners to really, um, they play the major role here on the, on the prevention of asthma uh, more. So the environment is much more important than the medication you're gonna use. Um, the medication will work even in a crappy environment, it's gonna work. However, when you stop the treatment, you're gonna have asthma again if you didn't improve the environment. So that's why, you know, those horses become a little bit higher maintenance than, you know, a horse that doesn't care and will never have asthma. So the key is not, how am I going to treat asthma? That's what you need to understand. The key is, how am I going to prevent asthma? How am I going to prevent exposure to dust and allergen? And unfortunately, you know, it's not easy. And I, everyone knows that and acknowledges that, you know, horses are not designed uh, to, you know, it's very, to, to be in a bubble, right? It's very hard to, to keep a horse in a dust-free environment, but we do what we can. And so we'll go over some of these things. So I said, you know, we want to work on the inflammation and we want to work on the environment. So let's go over the inflammation because, you know, first, so it's the, the medical treatment. So the inflammation will, you know, push on, you know, mucus, coughing and spasm or, or closure of the, the pipes, the, the bronchi. So how do we control the inflammation? Well, really it's one class of drugs that does that very well. It's called the corticosteroids, like cortisone type of things. Um, and there is two approaches. One is we use systemic corticosteroid or the other one is we use inhaled corticosteroid. So systemic corticosteroids, basically you inject or give orally, I, I prefer injections by far, uh, the corticosteroid, the medication. When you inject, you treat the whole body of the horse, including the lungs. And so that's where, you know, inhaled corticosteroids is really more, uh, a little bit more clever because you're just targeting the lungs. You're sending the drug medication in the lungs uh, and you're not treating the whole outside body outside the lungs. And why is this important? Well, because when you use systemic uh, treatments, so let's say IV injection, IM injections with corticosteroids, uh, and the best one that you may know is dexamethasone. Well, we, we all, all veterinarians know that there is a risk. So sometimes it's a small risk, sometimes it's negligible, but sometimes it can be quite severe. Uh, and a higher risk, and the risk is laminitis or fander. And so this is, you know, really a picture showing you like the uh, pastern of a horse. So that's a cut and you can see the bone here, the phalanx bone. So the fetlock would be right here above that picture. And so here you have the one phalanx, two phalanx and three phalanx. So that is the phalanx, the end of the, the finger basically in the hoof. So this is the hoof here. And what you can see is that finger, that bone is actually touching the bottom here and it's totally detached from the hoof and he wants to push down under the weight of the horse and will probably go through that hoof. And so that horse will go through his hoof. So this horse obviously is dead and was in anatomy uh, because he was suffering so much and it was um, a very, very bad uh, case here. And so that horse had to be put down. 
So again, those can be extreme uh, conditions, knocking on wood. If you do things right and you know the risks, you know, you can totally um, avoid this, but sometimes, you know, it happens. They, it, the zero risk doesn't exist. So there's always a small risk. And, uh, and unfortunately, when it happens, you know, you can end up with a dead hole. So not something to take lightly. And so those systemic dexamethasone treatments, for example, may even be obsolete today because, um, and Doug Myers will be here to, to show you the uh, new innovation uh, uh, from Boehringer. Now we have access to inhaled medications. And so we always had access to inhaled medications even before today where um, we use you know, the human puffers like the flow vent, for example, or we use the Flexinem, that big blue mask with dexamethasone solution. The problem with those older systems was that even with the puffers, even with the Flexinem, we still had um, side effects. We still had a risk for laminitis. We still had a, uh, some of that medication going through the lungs into the blood of the horse and going into the whole body of the horse, including the feet and doing these kind of issues. So it was still a risky proposition. It was still you know, uh, you know, much better than the dexamethasone injection, but still not a zero risk proposition. And so, and, and on top of it, it wasn't really a, a, a tested approved treatment, right? So now the only approved treatment, and that's re really recent, it's the, the new thing, you know, here in asthma and thanks to Boehringer and uh, really we should, uh, you should, I think very few people realize how much work and money this represents to get a drug certified and approved in different countries. I mean, it's insane. The number of hours, pages, and the expenses they have to go through. And, and so they test for safety, they test for efficacy, they test, you know, everything. And basically at the end, they finally, you know, they got the approval. And so it means that this uh, device and um, called the Equihaler has a cartridge in it of cyclizonide. And so the cyclizonide is the equivalent, if you want, of cortisone or dexamethasone in a can. But the trick is this is, a safe treatment, there is no side effect. So there is a, re it's a very tricky chemistry and maybe Doug can explain it um, uh, in details, but basically that drug stays in the lungs, it's activated in the lungs. And as soon as it comes out of the lung, it's totally deactivated and there is no side effects. So it's a very clever drug. It's a, we call it a pro medication. Um, and uh, it, the advantage, the, the, to me, the, clear advantage and why it's a winner, it's because there is no side effects. Uh, and of course it's, it works. I mean, there is clinical efficacy has been shown. So um, that was, you know, that's really now, sorry, that's really now the, the, the go-to treatment. It's the only approved treatment for, in terms of medication for equine asthma. Now, the other aspect and critical aspect, and I would even say more important aspect is the in environment. So how are we gonna manage that horse? How are we gonna prevent exposure to uh, dust or allergens? Well, if in the BAL I have those allergenic, you know, uh, um, uh, type of uh, reactions I can see, I will pay attention to allergens in the environment. It can be pollens, like you've seen on that slide, can be chemicals. So I'll ask if you know there were chemicals in the fields around the horse, chicken exposure, red pine in the building, and any unusual management practice should be a red flag. Maybe that's why this horse is allergic. He's allergic to something in the air in the environment, and we need to look and find what. Usually, you know, the go-to culprits for dust and allergens are number one, the bedding. So check, you know, number one, horses, if they're indoors, should not be on straw, unfortunately, but straw has like uh, more dust and more molds. Um, even wood shavings are not all the same. Like you want large size, high quality, no red pine type of wood shavings. Um, and if you, uh, if you swipe the, when you're sweeping the alley and cleaning up the barn and everything, you should get your horses outside. And ideally you should even wet a little bit the alleys. So not so much that it's damp and moisture and, and fungi are gonna grow, which is rare in Alberta anyway, but enough to keep the dust down. 
And that makes a huge difference. If you sprinkle the alleys, uh, studies have found that you decrease the dust by 90% uh, just by sprinkling the alley before you, you do the, the cleaning. Uh, and of course, if you're outdoor, I mean, it's not just the dust from, you know, like pollen and trees and things like that. It's also the mineral dust. So the dust from the gravel roads, the dust from the arena, the paddock. So all these types of dust are important. The second culprit, the source of dust, the main one, the go-to one is the hay. Um, horses, you know, leave, unfortunately, you know, we're domesticating horses and we have to feed them in the winter because it's a, you know, winter climate here. So we need to have hay. So hay is dry and dusty and even worse, can be moldy. Um, so if you have an asthma horse, usually we really like to recommend hay cubes. Uh, again, they are processed, they are not moldy. The fancy one is the hay gain, so you can steam the hay and I'll come back to it. And really, if you really, really have to twist my arm and really have to keep your round hay bales, you could try that slow, uh, slow feeder hay net to cover it, so to prevent the digging. I don't find these super effective, but you know they probably don't hurt. They probably help a little bit, but I don't have any data to to tell you if it's really working or not. And that my in my experience, it's kind of a eh, not super effective. So I always joke, you know, with the owners uh, I talk to when they have asthma. So you see that crappy, you know, black hay here, there on the top. This is full of fungi molds. I mean, these should be just burnt, you know, like these front hay bales, uh, give them to the cows or burn them, but don't, don't give that to your horses. And of course, you know, the fancy ones, um, so you can have the hay gain. So those big ones here are steamers. Uh, to steam, you know, a full bale of hay. And I think it's really practical. So you, you can have those bags where if you're on the road, instead of having a hay net in the nose or in the face of your horse in the trailer, which is terrible, hay nets are bad. Uh, then, you know, you use cubes or you can use, you know, steam hay in the bag. And there is another company, I'm actually not sure if it's still in business, but there was that cheaper, but also lower quality, honestly, um, uh, hay steamer on the market. So you can, uh, you can shop around, but the hay again works, and, but it's unfortunately quite expensive. I had an owner send me those pictures. She made her own hay steamer. Like she said, well, okay, it's too expensive. And so she used that, you know, uh, house, um, house steaming um, device, steaming device and, um, and um, uh, plugged uh, it onto uh, the bottom of a gutted, you know, chest freezer and, uh, and used it this way. So it's not as good because in the hay steamers, there are some spikes, you know, to send the steam inside in the middle. So inside out in the middle of the bell. So this wouldn't do it, but probably would help. Um, there is also a new device like from Quebec where they have this Nutri, nutri foin. It's uh, basically a device where it's mixing oil onto the hay and kind of uh, mixing everything. Um, and it's actually so uh, keeping the dust into the hay uh, and also adding the oil, uh, uh, you know, uh, energetic value. Uh, funny thing is, you know, when uh, uh, many years ago, I thought, well, the best is probably to prevent inhalation of dust. So I actually have a patent on that device, which is a, a nostril insert. Uh, with that kind of very uh, strange uh, shape, but you know, it fits in the nostrils, can stay in. And we have these uh, prototypes, but we don't have ones with the filters. I honestly never got the guts to uh, put a filter on there because I was afraid if the filter, you know, clogs or whatever. So still needs more work, but that would be, you know, again, the, uh, the idea would be to prevent inhalation of dust, but unfortunately it's not easy to do in whole. So I'll, I'll end up, uh, that, that's really the end of that presentation. So in summary, I'll go back to, okay, what we've learned so far. So high prevalence of lung inflammation. So it's not an infection again, it's an inflammation, more like allergies type of thing. Very, very common in horses. Clinical signs, uh, there is a difference between the severe asthma horses, the, those are at rest, having trouble breathing. And the mild moderate asthma horses, those are more, you know, coughing mucus during exercise or even at rest. Um, and so importance of the cough. If you see a horse coughing at rest or during exercise, 
it's not normal. It could be benign, but it could be, you know, uh, more definitely worth uh, checking and addressing. Mucus is important and it does decrease uh, performance. Mucus has some significant effect on the performance of the horses. How do you diagnose asthma? The best test really is um, uh, BAL. And it's not just a yes or no, I have or I don't have asthma in this horse. It's also the degree, the type of inflammation, and even if there is dust in those lungs. In terms of treatment, well, unfortunately, there is no cure. So we talk more about prevention. And so prevention, the key is really management. So how do you decrease exposure to dust? And that should be the first thing. And then the treatment. So the treatments are based on corticosteroids. And uh, from now on, the only approved uh, treatment for severe asthma is now the inhaled uh, cyclazonide. So it's uh, the Boringer product, the Azervo with the Equihaler um, that uh, Doug will, will explain uh, in details here. And just again, to finish, I'll plug that research project where uh, again, we're, in, we're doing research on asthma. We are looking for nine horses uh, this summer who have some cough and or some mucus. So they have my moderate asthma probably. And uh, we would board the horses, do a BAL, uh, treat them, run them on the track with that uh, mass before and after treatment. And we would use uh, your horses for uh, 20 days and you would get some compensation for that. So if you have horses you think would be uh, fitting that uh, those criteria and you would be interested, uh, let me know. You can uh, send me an email to that, that email address. And I would like to finish by uh, thanking uh, Doug and Luisa. So Dr. Doug Myers from Boringer and uh, Luisa Murfoy from Energy Coin, the clinical director there for the invitation. And, uh, and I think uh, Luisa, I'll let you uh, take it from there for question and answers, right? Yeah, would, um, should we start with some Acervo talk or should we go right to the Q&A? Oh yeah, so. perfect. Let's, let's do like, so we have a, we have a quick video to show you about the Acervo inhaler with Dr. Myers here. I'm just gonna see if I can share my screen. So I should stop sharing mine. Yes, that'd be great. And now, now it's all yours. Perfect. Okay, so let's make see if I can make this work here. All right, you guys get to see all my nice. <laughs> Where did it go? There's Luisa on her yeah, cutting Who hopefully doesn't have to have the servo aquahaler this year during show season. But I know some good guys that could help me out if he does, I guess. I don't know who you're talking about. <laughs> all right, sorry guys. This dang my dang uh computer didn't Put it into the cloud. So we'll just wait two quick seconds. And... I love how, how those horses are watching, you know, like they're like, it's incredible, right? I mean, they are so wired, right? They are just like, like a, like a cat, right? It's yes. crazy. Oh, this is a, he's a good pony. All right, looks like we're just about to get there. I'll see if I can open it up. So you may have to share your screen with the video because, um, Sometimes, you know, you play the video, you see it, but we don't see it. Uh... We are almost there. And then we will see what we can see. Yeah, so shout out to my son, Braden. He was the uh, technology behind this, yeah. vi this video yesterday. We talked about coming in here and doing this live, but it's just very busy here to try to get a horse to come in. It was just going to be easier. So I took one of my quarter horse geldings at home and he cooperated and my son did some editing and. All right, so you guys should be able to see it now. Hopefully our internet connection is very yeah. clear. Um, so we'll go from there and hopefully you guys have. Perfect. Seen well, hello folks. Uh, I'm Dr. Doug Myers. I'm the Western Canadian Equine Technical Services Veterinarian with Boringer Engelheim. And we're gonna do a live demonstration of the Acervo Equihaler on one of my quarter horses today. This is. This is Red. I've had him for quite a few years, and he's a good mountain horse. So the Acerbo Equihaler is a recently approved uh, equine asthma uh, inhalation therapy uh, for severe equine asthma. Um, the product has actually been worked on for 10 years. It's quite unique. It comes in a box, uh, an instruction um, booklet to certainly go through, and there's a QR code uh, on the outside of the box that we encourage everybody to have a look at with their, uh, with their iPhone, and that will take you to a website where there's some uh, excellent uh, uh, user information. 
So you can see when you take the Acervo out of the box, um, it's got a, a, a large handle that's depressed outside and this is the piercing element. So the first thing before you use this, certainly go all through the information and look at the videos, but you have to depress this piercing element in completely in the handle so uh, you can't see it anymore. And that is what, uh, that is what pierces the canister of cyclesonide. So cyclesonide is a unique corticosteroid. And then this uh, servo equihaler is, is what's called soft mist technology. So I'll show you how to do this. So you depress this fully in. Some people stop there, but that's, that's inaccurate. You wanna keep going. So it completely disappears in that. And you can see that now. Um, so it's not that hard, but you gotta make sure and just do that, that final little push so it's, it, it disappears in there and you can't see anything. You now have to do a series of three puffs or priming um, to get the uh, servo activated. So it, it consists of one full pull of the handle. You let it go. And then you can see the handle uh, drops back out here again, or the piercing element. And it, there's a red, uh, um, a red button you can see there. Then you do just a fine little feather that releases the spring. And that's when the, that's when the mist is uh, released after the third try. So there's one. So again, one full pull. You can see it goes red again. Just a little release. There's some mist starting to come out of there already. And you can see this now shows um, 90 to 100 uh, percent activity. And so that will go down as you use the product over 10 days. So we have to do one more full pull. And then I'll do the half pull and you'll be able to see the mist starting to come out. So that's the soft mist. So that's now ready to go. You only have to do that once on day one. And then after that, for the next 10 days, um, it's a series of puffs as per label. So it's uh, eight puffs twice a day for the first uh, five days. So you would do that about 12 hours apart. And then it's 12 puffs once a day for the following five days. So it's a 10 day treatment regime. You'll use 140 puffs um, throughout the 10 days. There's 160 in here. So you've got 20 extra to play with if the horse happens to um, you know, not want to get a dose or two into them or you miss the nostril or something like that. So the acervo is designed to be held in your left hand and uh, inserted into the left nostril of the horse. So the easiest way that uh, we found to do this is to take your right hand, go underneath, hold over the bridge of the nose. You may want to take your fingers and just open up the nares a little there so you don't go into the false nostril. And then you hold this uh, laterally, we call it the chicken wing technique. So you get your elbow up high, come in nice and slow, introduce it, and then rotate down. So the acervo equihaler is now vertical. You can see it's up and down. We've got a nice tight seal. We're not in the false nostril. And then this breath view indicator, we can use that to time as to when. So the full pull activates the spring and gets the cyclesonide coming up the handle. And then the second very light little pull is just a feather. And that releases the soft mist with the cyclesonide in it. So we'll do that again. And you can hear that click. And there's the odd horse that certainly gets a little sensitized to that click. And there's the release and he's inhaled this in. So this is just a placebo. There's no cyclesonide in there. This is just for training purposes. And uh, so it's a series of eight of these twice a day. So the full pull and a lot of people want to over pull that second pull. You just have to, it's a very light little feathering just to release that spring. And then you can see that mist come in there. If you can time it with breathing, that's fine. If you can't, uh, it's not a big deal because the mist is, is contained in here. This is a self-contained unit when the mist is in there. And as long as you have a good seal in the nostril, uh, it can't go anywhere. So we'll just do another one, full pull. Wait for him to breathe out. There he goes and we'll release that. So again, it's pretty easy, you know, for most horses to give. We, they they, they had 97% acceptance rate uh, when they were treating horses. Um, it's an extremely effective drug. We'll get into that a little bit later during this Facebook Live. But I just want to demonstrate, um, again, kind of the mechanics of the product. Um, just take your time. There's some excellent videos uh, on our website. There's a equine behaviorist from Scotland named Dr. Gemma Pearson, who's done some really good uh, high quality videos for us on trading. So uh, that's it. I uh, hope you enjoyed the demonstration. All right. That, your horse was so good. Yeah, red. No, old Red. <laughs> he had some practice last summer. We had the U.S. technical team up uh, 18 months ago and we practiced on my horses and yeah, they all did very well. So uh, go ahead.
course that I've, um, I've been comment or contacted on so far that was having trouble getting, uh, uh, the owner was getting the product into it. I went down and worked with her for about an hour and we went over that gem at Pearson video. So yeah, sure. One of the take homes is before you uh, start using this on your horse, um, you know, do your homework, learn how to properly set that up. The clinics, we our, our sales reps have been busy, you know, training all the veterinary clinics on how to properly prepare the acervo so it's ready to go and uh, um, look at these, look at the instruction booklet, look at the Gemma Pearson videos. And uh, once people get, get away to it, it's, it's, it's quite easy to use. Yeah. So anything else you'd like to add about the acervo? This is your floor. So yeah, the drug is quite unique as, uh, as uh, Renault mentioned, it's, a, it's called a pro drug. And so it's activated deep into the lung epi epithelium. It's taken into the cell. There's an enzyme called esterase that acts on it. And then it cleaves that cyclesonide into a drug called desiclesonide. And that's the active component. And that's the one that has the uh, very good, uh, strong anti-inflammatory effects. It's got 12, it's 12 times more potent than dexamethasone for binding. And we know dex has been a good drug for treating equine asthma. It's just the side effects. And cyclesonide has no, uh, no measurable side effects for cortisol suppression. So for horses that you're uh, at risk of, of having uh, like a PPID horse or an EMS that you'd specifically worry about having a laminitic episode. Uh, I know when I was in practice, I used to, every time I put a horse on decks for whatever reason, when I, when I drive out on the road, you kind of say a little prayer to yourself that you hope that isn't the horse that, that founders on you. And so this takes that risk away uh, tremendously. Um, it's got soft mist technology, which we uh, uh, kind of patented or borrowed from our human side of the company. Uh, we've got some uh, puffers that they use for uh, uh, human asthma. And so the soft mist is a nice slow release. It's about a second. Um, so the horse can inhale it quite easily. Uh, and it's the right particle size too. And so it's, it's under five microns, um, which, you know, Renault talks about quite a bit, that that's the correct size that you need to get deep down into the, into the terminal lung epi epithelial in the, in the alveoli to be absorbed. Um, the problem with some of the nebulizers that are on the market where you're just uh, trying different products is they've never been validated to show that that product can get down into the lungs where it needs to work. And there's been numerous studies that show only 10% of the drug actually uh, gets, uh, gets inhaled and gets to where it, where it needs to be. Perfect. Are you, do you want to head into the Q&A? Sure. All right. So we will have Dr. Myers and Dr. Leg Belay uh, cover us off with the Q&A. Somebody asked, what's the cost of that product? Another client answered, <laughs> mine was $382.58. That is the cost of the Acerbo Equihaler. Here at Energy Equine, it can vary from practice to practice. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and obviously, as both gentlemen said, please work with your veterinarians, whether it's one of ours or another one, to make sure that that's actually the product that you need for your horse. We had a question. Unlike the human asthmatic drugs, can you recycle oh, the acervo? Excellent question. So yeah, the product is already made of 50% recycled products. So when you get it, they've already recycled some of the products to get it uh, designed. And then we've set up a, uh, a partnership with a company called TerraCycle. And uh, you can get that website through your clinic. Uh, um, our, our territory managers have, have sent that information out to all the different clinics across Canada. And so TerraCycle, when you go on there, you just type in a servo equihaler and Canada, and it takes you to the servo equihaler recycling page. And uh, you can print off a shipping label, uh, attach it to the box. So that's a good idea to keep your, your handy dandy box with you here. And uh, the servo, you can just keep it in there in between treatments. And then you just mail that back in and it's sent back in and it's recycled. Uh, about 50% again. So we're certainly doing our best to try to keep, uh, you know, to keep it out of the landfills. Um, and also there's no CFCs in this product. So that was been one of the knocks against some of the human MDIs is they worry about the CFCs for ozone depletion. This is all mechanically generated with the spring. And so when you're pulling that a servo the first time, you're, you know, you're, you're releasing cyclesonide that goes out of the canister and up a capillary tube. And then when you do that soft little feather the second time, that opens up a valve at the top, and that's when the soft mist uh, comes out with a combination of the ethanol and the cyclesonide combined. Okay. If you guys do have any questions, just drop them in the chat. I'll ask one to Dr. Renault. Um, in, the, in the work that you've been doing as far as preventative and um, uh, low levels of equine asthma, what does that look like with the acerbo equihaler? Um, so... 
uh, do you mean if it's if it if it's working basically, right? Yeah, like can you like have you done any work with preventative like maintenance dosing of the acervo or? Oh yes, low doses. Yeah, well that's uh, because yeah, like like uh, you know, uh, Doug said like the label is for severe asthma treatment for ten days, and of course you know everyone say okay, so what's going on after ten days? What do I do? And what if I don't have severe asthma and I have mild or moderate asthma? Of course. Um, well, there are lots of unknowns there, to be honest, like really, uh, uh, we, it's a new product and we are actually doing a lot of research. Um, uh, I think I'm not the only one, but you know, uh, several people are doing research to answer those questions. So we will have more scientific evidence down the road. Meanwhile, um, myself, you know, I, uh, I have definitely uh, suggested that use at a lower dose for longer duration to the clients who have a uh, low degree, mild or moderate inflammation type of case. Um, and so far, you know, the response has been great. So it seems that, again, severe inflammation, you need to follow the label strictly. And um, my moderate inflammation, well, then again, have to discuss it with your veterinarian. But uh, there is definitely some uh, good potential for a lower dose, longer duration type of treatment to maintain those horses. So this was the approach I had like before the Azervo with you know either dexamethasone or the other uh, puffers. Before we were always trying you know less of those steroids is better, right? And in this case, it's still the same. And so you always try to get the lowest dose that still works. But of course, now you're kind of experimenting a little bit on your own horse and uh, each horse is different. So the label dose is really the research for, you know, the severe cases, the worst case scenario. So again, they had those horses, very severe asthma in maintained in a crappy environment, like really dusty barn and the drug was still working uh, after 10 days. Of course, if you do your homework and improve the environment and your horse is not that severe and, and, and then of course you can, in my opinion, decrease the dosage and extend the duration. But now you're kind of off label and, and we don't have data yet uh, to show how well it works. So we're working on it. And that's actually why I'm recruiting horses these days. <laughs> no, good point. I mean, this drug was just approved uh, the end of January here in Canada. It was uh, mid-September in the US and it was last June uh, in the EU. So it's you know, that happens quite often in veterinary medicine where a product is, is released and it's got a, a label approval for this condition. But then once it's out into the marketplace, they get researchers and, you know, key opinion leaders around the world that start doing their own projects on it. So uh, I'm sure as time goes on, we'll, there'll be, you know, certainly some more, more data generated on, on use of this product. Um, it was, a, it was uh, tested over in Europe and, uh, and North America. There is about 300 horses in each continent um, uh, that had severe equine asthma. And as Dr. Uh, Legule said, they had to be kept maintained. They weren't allowed to be taken out of their, their poor environment. They had to stay on that the whole time. And it was a controlled study where half got placebos, half got uh, uh, the acervo equihaler. And there was a, you know, certainly a statistically significant improvement in the horses uh, that were again, maintained in the crappy environment, which people won't do once they start treating their horse with this. That's number one is you've got to get that horse and try and do some improvements, um, you know, with the air it's breathing and the, the feed it's consuming and the, the bedding it's, it, it's living in. But uh, yeah, the servo, even in a worst case scenario, really improved the, uh, you know, respiration of these horses. We do have another question that just came in. Can, for Dr. Legley, can equine asthma be exercise induced like in humans? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So uh, the short answer is no, except... Uh, when it's very cold. Um, so extremely cold conditions, yes. Um, there is only one study actually, but, and it's funny because they did that study in Oklahoma. I know the researcher very well. And he was trying to get those horses in Oklahoma in very cold conditions. So he had, you know, a room with a high speed treadmill in the middle and the room was going down to, you know, minus 15. And I told him, you should just have come here. And we could have done it, you know, outside without any, you know, a refrigerator, freezer type of equipment. <laughs> um, so anyway, the answer is no. So, you know, except again in very cold conditions. Mm -hmm. 
All right. I think that might be the end of our q and I don't see anything else coming in. Margaret said, thank you. Oh, oh, no, no, just kidding. They're, they're coming in now. Um, Jen asked in relation to that last question, Dr. Legoule, equine is seasonal though. Uh, yes. So equine has my seasonal uh, mostly. So again, each horse is a little bit different, but it's very true overall. I see more cases in the spring and in the fall. Um, that being said, it depends again on, on each horse and the condition. So if you go in the east, it's more winter issue because horses are inside more. So they're in those barns, you know, wet and dusty and everything. So they don't like the winter there. Uh, but here in Alberta, mostly spring and fall. And then Braden, Dr. Myers asked, could the drug in a servo be adopted for human use? There is already a human product out called Elvesco. Um, it doesn't come in as a soft mist technology. We actually, there was a, uh, a, a global equine asthma event happened last weekend that uh, Dr. Renault was one of the keynote speakers on and they had a human asthma specialist from the UK on. And he mentioned a couple of times that the human doctors are quite jealous that we in veterinary medicine have seclesonide with soft fist technology oh. because they've been asking for that for years on the human side and it hasn't been done. So, uh, yeah, we've got the right, it, you needed both of these for that, for this product to be so effective. You needed the soft mist, which breaks that down into those nice small five micron particles, gets it into the lungs. And then you need the, the correct drug, which is seclesonide. So mm. they, they really did hit a home run on this one. Good question, Braden. That was a good one. All right, everyone. I think we will wrap up this sports therapy lecture. Does every cough mean something? I think we learned today that it in fact does mean something. Yeah. So if your horse is coughing, please call your veterinarian and we would be happy to take a look and go from there based on the, all the things that we talked about today. Dr. Legoulet, thank you very much for your time today. We very much appreciate it. Thank you, Luisa, for organizing this and, uh, and thank you, Doug, too, for, uh, for the sponsoring. Thank you, Renault. It's always good to have you on board. We're, we're so lucky here in Alberta to have Renault and his colleagues at UCVM. We've got world-class experts just down the road and they're only too willing to help out. So yeah, we feel pretty. <laughs> thank you. And then of course, thank you, Dr. Myers yeah. for joining us in real life and also for Boeing for sponsoring yeah, and being such, such great partners in the equine industry for our clinic and many others. So thank you everyone. This will be recorded and will be uploaded onto our YouTube probably next week. So you can watch it back and, uh, Get all your information ready to call your vets on Monday morning. Thank you very much. Have a all great right. day. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.